right, welcome back everyone. I'm going to invite you all to go ahead and take your seats and uh, we'll get started back again here shortly. We're going to have the uh, opportunity during lunch to carry on some of these conversations. All right. Thank you all. I want to thank you all again for coming. This is just incredibly uh, educational for all of us to, to hear your stories and experiences. We're going to start with a few polling questions. And are you guys pulling those up in the back? I don't see them. OK. <laughs> Ah, here we go. All right. So the second segment will focus primarily on treatments that you have been on. And the first question is, uh, have you ever used any of the following therapies to treat your hypereosinophilic syndrome? And check all that apply. So any type of steroid is the first choice. Hydroxyurea, interferon alpha, drugs that target... Uh, IL-5, and that includes those listed there that are currently approved for eosinophilic asthma and have been in clinical trials. Uh, Gleevec is choice E. Other chemotherapies such as cyclophosphamide or cytoxin or CAMPATH and natural or alternative medicines. And that's an all that apply question. All right, I think we've got almost all the results in. So steroids would by far be the most common therapy that people have tried along with the anti-IL-5 agents and uh, followed by alternative medicines. Our next question is, are you currently using any of the following therapies to treat your hypereosinophilic syndrome and the choices are the same? And this is for current therapies only. All right, I think we've got all the results in there. Uh, it looks like steroids is the most common currently used treatment along with IL-5 and alternative medicines. And I believe this is the last polling question before we get back to our panel. Have you ever tried to stop treatment with any hyperosinophilic syndrome medication due to side effects from that medication? And this is uh, got three choices. No, I continue them all without side effects. Uh, no, I haven't stopped them. I continue to use them despite side effects. And yes, I stopped them due to side effects.
All right, I think we've got everybody in now. Uh, so uh, interestingly, uh, the majority are continuing to use hyperacinophilic syndrome medications despite experiencing side effects, uh, with a third responding that they have stopped them due to side effects. All right, we're going to get back to our discussion segment. The first question is about treatments that you currently are using, treatments you are currently using. Uh, what do you like about the treatment you're currently using? What don't you like about it? What are the downsides? What concerns do you have? And how well do you feel it controls your symptoms? So that's a lot of stuff wrapped into one. Um, Shelly, are you up for starting? Um, currently, the uh, treatment that I'm on is uh, weekly methotrexate injections um, at a pretty high dose. I also take a PO Singular, Omeprazole, Visteral, and Folic Acid. Um, unfortunately, because of my absorption issues, uh, the likelihood of the PO medications helping me is slim to none. Um, I am also on TPN, which is IV nutrition. Uh, that's how I get all of my nutrients, um, as well as uh, IV Phenergan for severe nausea, vomiting, and I am on twice a day Lovenox shots for uh, my blood clots in my uh, lungs and chest. Um, unfortunately, with the Lovenox shots, even though it's been almost five months, um, my body is not absorbing them, um, so the clots are not getting any better. Um, I would say that the best thing about the methotrexate is that it's once a week. Um, I don't have to worry about it uh, daily. Um, the worst thing about it is the side effects I have. Um, it gives me worsening joint pain and nausea. Um, usually after 24 to 48 hours, the symptoms subside. Um, and my biggest concern is if the drug is actually helping or not. Um, yes, it has helped bring my peripheral counts down, but as far as my biopsies, uh, nothing has changed. In fact, my counts continue to go up, um, as well as affecting my organs. Um, I've recently had uh, issues with my lungs, um, and then um, my doctors also think that the eosinophils have caused inflammation in the brain. Um, so I would say that that's my biggest concern is if the drug is actually helping me. Um, I was also on iron infusions for several months due to my severe anemia, but unfortunately I developed an allergy to the iron. And despite trying four different types of iron, um, we still can't find anything that I'm allergic to. So. Uh, the issue with my severe anemia uh, is cause for great concern as well. Um, the only thing I like about it is that the side effects only last a day. Um, I'm nauseous the entire day. Um, my husband now, I originally I would drive myself back and forth to VCU. It was a three-hour round trip. Um, and then I'd sit in the office for about three hours for a half hour infusion, infusion and go back home. Um, but it lasted one day. That was a good thing. Um, what I don't like is that it doesn't help with my chronic fatigue um, or the pain, and that my eosinophils and my organs, it hasn't been helping with that at all, with the levels. Um, my current treatment, uh I take uh, the interferon shot once a week. Um, it makes me feel good in terms of disease, uh, but I also feel a lot of flu-like symptoms, and I can tell that it's hard on my liver. Um, the cyclosporine, um, I've had a couple issues with kidneys. Um, 
so it's a benefit versus risk. Uh, I can tell when my kidneys aren't doing good, um, so I'll try to lower it, but I absolutely need it. And then the steroid, um, that is, uh, I try to only use that for rescue. Um, just get like immediate quick dose. Uh, biggest thing with that is the skeletal system because um, it's done a fair amount of damage already. And then the Mepo, um, I just feel achy a little after it. Um, I haven't had any side effects um, that worry me yet. Um, for me, for the Nucala, the most, um, what I do like about it is that it, it's working. <laughs> um, and I don't have, uh, I was able to get off of prednisone, which was my main goal. Um, the most significant downside is um, just the day I have the shot, um, and usually a few days after, um, the day I have the shot, I try not to plan anything else. In fact, I usually plan to try to get a massage because um, the back pain and the joint pain um, and the headache is pretty um, uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, and then within the few days after that, I try not to plan a lot just because I know I'm going to be pretty achy. Um, my concerns about it are just what are the long-term effects on my body from this because I've been told it's, you know, it hasn't been, there's not any long-term studies on how this might affect my body later on or other things it could cause. Um, so I, that would be a concern of mine. Um, but it does control my symptoms, so um, I'm happy about that. Any comments from anyone in the audience about their current treatment side effects? Amy, have the mic there. Yeah. Anybody have any comments? No? Okay. All right. The next uh, question for the panel is, uh, how does the treatment impact your day-to-day -day life? In what way does your current treatment impact your day-to-day -day life? Um, well, I just, just to kind of continue on what I was just saying, I, I've kind of already mentioned um, there's a few days where I'm kind of out of commission. Um, sometimes it lasts longer, but it's just, you know, I just kind of push through it, take some Advil. Um, otherwise, I'm able to, other than the brain fog, I'm able to, to have an active day-to-day -day life. Um, I, uh, the... Interferon shot, I definitely have to um, take it easy the next day. Um, sometimes in the morning, it'll it'll be like severe, like fever, um, chill feeling. Um, and then between the uh, cyclosporine and um, the mepolizumab and steroids, it's, it's just a normal thing for me. Um, it's hard to compare a different life, um, really, I, I mean, I feel like I'm here, I'm waking up and, you know, functioning decently as a mother and wife, so. Um. Um, the treatment, hmm. it affects my daily life. On so many levels. Uh, um, well, we go in with my infusions. Um, I typically get nauseous. I used to drive myself, and now my husband drives me. Um, I always know when I'm due for an infusion about one to two weeks prior. I feel like my knuckles are dragging on the ground. Um, I don't have much strength. Um, I get very tired. I still get up, and I still push to go to work but it gets more and more difficult towards the end um, of the month whenever I need my infusion again. Um, like I said before, uh, the side effects I have from the methotrexate usually last anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. It's usually worsening joint pain, um, muscular, you know, horrible muscle pain, and um, worsening nausea and vomiting. Um, but I think that mostly 
my treatment affects my life in the fact that it doesn't control my symptoms. I don't have any symptom relief from the methotrexate. So um, the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, unable to eat, all these things are still happening because, unfortunately, my treatment plan doesn't help with any of my symptoms. All right. So for you, the biggest side effect is that it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. Any comments from the audience on their treatment, their current treatment, and how it impacts day-to-day -day life? Got a comment in the back, Amy. Um, I am on long-term steroids, and I've been on a high dose for about eight years. I think what is hardest to deal with is having a flare-up when you're traveling or when you're not somewhere familiar and honestly coming off a little crazy because I tell them, like, you need to give me steroids, you need to give me this, you need to give me that, and always being prepared for the worst. Because there are days where you have really good days and you feel great and something flares up. And I've had, on countless occasions, you know, doctors say, this girl's crazy. Like, you can't listen to her. She's, you know, going for drugs. But it's basically being, like, your own advocate, your own doctor, and always being ready for something bad to happen. In regards to what you just said, when I was first diagnosed, uh, a doctor had put me on pain medication to help with my pain. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't working as well as I had hoped. So when I was complaining about the pain, numerous doctors accused me of being a narcotic seeker, just simply looking for the narcotics. And no matter how many times I said my pain is still at an eight, no one really listened. And the problem wasn't that I needed more narcotics. The problem was that they weren't working at all. And instead of listening to me and my problems and my symptoms, they just quickly flipped the switch and determined that I was seeking for narcotics. So I know what you're talking about. Hi, one thing to mention on the prednisone, especially if we are um, changing doses, is also the mental effect, where I describe it as kind of going between the Incredible Hulk and Sylvia Plath and, you know, the same day. So, and that has a big impact on my family. And I loved what someone said is learning to recognize what was, I can't believe what they said, but it was like, you know, medically induced anger versus your real anger. Um, and I think that's a big piece, you know, and I even trying to think ahead again when it happens, like a way not to be around my family. Um, just, you know, you can't, it's very hard to control it. Um, and you, you know, the impact it has on everyone around you as you're uh, going up and down on, on steroids, especially with children who I think, you know, can't get it quite as much. Um, it has a big impact on daily life then. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Mary Jo, I see an opportunity here to mm -hmm. develop some materials that are simple, perhaps on a card that patients can share with emergency room providers and doctors to uh, help explain what's what and maybe avoid some of these traumas. Do you have that, Amy? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cleon. I'm sorry to comment. comment. I know this is a patient conference, but so what I often recommend, because the steroid issue is a really big issue, and I will say up front that I do not get any kickback and I have no um, financial interest, but there's a really great book that was written by Pinka Zuckerman, the violinist's wife, Eugenia Zuckerman who developed chronic eosinophilic pneumonia when she played flute for the Philharmonic and had to go on high-dose steroids. Some of you older people may remember that she was on Good Morning America, um, oh no, sun, I'm sorry, Sunday morning um, for six months when she couldn't play flute. And she wrote a book with her sister-in-law who's a physician called Coping with Prednisone, um, which talks about all the things that patients hate about prednisone that doctors don't care about. So we care about bone density loss and diabetes, but not as, it's not that we don't care, but we're less concerned about some of the 
the issues with eating and waking up at night and those things. And this book really details them very nicely. It's a useful book, not so much for the people that are taking the steroids, but for their family members and colleagues so that they understand that it's not that they're crazy, as was mentioned, but it's, it's the drug. Um, so I recommend that to everybody. You can get it on amazon.com. It's been, it's not very expensive. Thank you for that resource. All right, well, speaking of steroids, that is our next question. So for those of you who have been or are on steroids, and I think everyone has mentioned that they either are or have been on steroids, what do you like about the steroids? What don't you like about them? And what concerns do you have, if any, about steroid therapies? OK. Uh, so um, unlike many other um, patients with hyperosinophilic syndrome, I am unable to tolerate the steroids. Um, my doctors have tried a handful, I'd say five or six times, of extremely high dose IV steroids. And by day four or day five, the joint pain and the nausea and just all the side effects that come along with it were so bad for me that I couldn't even get out of my bed to use the bathroom. Um, the, the side effects were just so crippling that no matter how many times we tried, we would do a week and then take some time off and try again that um, the side effects were so bad that they outweighed the benefits that I was getting for my eosinophil counts. Um, like I've mentioned several times, I do have absorption issues. So um, in the long term, side, uh, steroids just weren't an option for me, unfortunately. Um, I was on steroids for five years, and that was 13, no, 18 years ago when I started, and 13 years ago when I stopped. Um, the only thing I liked about it was it gave me more energy considering that I am always fatigued. Um, that is something that would help. Um, what I don't like about it is the weight gain, the roid rage, um, preventing me from sleeping. And I was eating a lot of Little Debbie's. <laughs> a lot. I'm talking like six boxes a day. <laughs> um, so that was my thing, Little Debbie's. Um, my biggest concern with the steroids is the long-term dam long damage to joints, muscles, and eyes. Um, two years ago, even though I hadn't been on steroids for several years, two years ago, my uh, eye doctor noticed I had cataracts. I was having trouble seeing. He waited six months. They had progressed very fast um, in six months. I had to have cataract surgery on both eyes. And then um, I still wasn't able to see clearly. And they had to do another surgery because there was a pocket behind my eye that um, they had to put a hole in, basically, with a laser so that I could see all the way through. And when I saw colors, all I can say is I looked at my house, and I could not believe that I had painted the walls that color. And I mixed matched everything. So the uh, good thing is I can see now. And my house is still a mess, but it'll get there. That's all. Um, I have, I've had a long, uh, very, very long journey with the steroids. Um, so my husband calls me LJ with the steroids. Like, that's my name. And I'm just mean and irrational and just ridiculous <laughs> to him. But... Um, the thing I like the about them in the you know is that they they are there as a a rescue medication. I don't I don't think I um, would be sitting here if the steroids weren't here. Um, the th uh, bad things about them um, I have uh, like multiple fractures in my spine and neck. Um, they, I have osteopenia. Um, someone told me I am like an 80 year old uh, skeletal frame. And, uh, you know, I got off of steroids, I want to say it was like three or four years ago. 
And it was just a really eye-opening experience. Like, everything was just different. Like, the food tasted different. What I thought was a big deal then wasn't now. And I just love differently. Like, it's, it's just crazy how much... I mean, I believe, for, you know, the more and more you're on them, that they never just stop hurting you. Um, that it, you know, it's just an ongoing um, damage going on, so. Uh, I was on prednisone for about 15 months. Um, when I first got out of the hospital, I was taking 60 milligrams a day and it was tapering down and then kind of in between. Um, what I liked about the steroids, um, I'm really lucky because it worked for me. They saved my life. Um, they're, they're affordable. Um, my prescription was almost nothing, so that made it really easy, easy to take. Um, and uh, like uh, she mentioned, the energy, when I was taking those higher doses and everyone, I got home from the hospital and everyone's like, you need to rest, you need to take it easy. And I'm like, I can't, I'm ready to like get up, I wanna clean the house, I wanna do this and that. And, and so <laughs> after being tired for a year, I was energized, so that was nice. Um, what I didn't like about the steroids was um, obviously the weight gain, um, the moon face, the roid rage. I have two teenage boys at home and those poor boys <laughs> had to endure some pretty serious roid rage for a while. I mean, when I first got out of the hospital, I was so happy to be alive that I was in a pretty good mood for, for a bit, but that didn't last very long. Um, I, also, uh, hair growth and loss. I was getting it in places I didn't want it and losing it in places I didn't want to lose it. Um, and, you know, I, I felt bad for being upset about that because I thought, I'm being vain. I should just be happy that I'm here. And um, so that was frustrating. Um, the concerns I have about steroids would be the long-term effect on the body, the bone loss, the damage to the adrenal glands, which was one of the reasons I fought so hard to get off of it and find another option. Any comments from the audience? And uh, those of you who are online, I believe you can call in and we will hear you. Is that right, Mary Jo? Hello. So, uh, re yeah, regarding the uh, the prednisone on uh, the impact on my daughter, I would say that um, I mean, weight gain was the first and foremost. She went from, at, I guess, about age seven or eight, she went from 46 pounds to 85 pounds in under a year. Uh, fortunately, uh, my business is weight loss, and uh, look, so we she came to me and said, "Hey, Dad, you know, can you help me?" We worked, we put together, I wasn't gonna say a word to her, so she came to me and we helped, I put together just a, a program, I basically I kept it simple. I said, you can eat as much as you want of all these things, but not these. It pretty much was just a low sugar diet. Just took her off of carb, a lot of carbs and sugars. She's managed to maintain, I think, uh, managed to maintain her weight and, and get it back under uh, control. Uh, you know, and today she's, uh, she's fantastic. Um, it, my frustration with the, the prednisone besides the weight was that although it helped to um, I, I, I guess to control her eosinophil count, it did nothing for her primary symptoms, as far as I could tell, which were her sinuses and her lungs. She essentially had a head cold, uh, the worst head cold you can imagine, 24-7, 365, and she had 100% blockage. She had two major sinus surgeries, you know, severe polyposis. I mean, it was deforming the bones in her face as because she couldn't, they couldn't grow and form properly. It was that severe. So it wasn't helping what, as a patient, we were experiencing as the, she was experiencing as a, you know, a primary symptom of it. Again, similar, uh, son was in high school during most of this time, and because it suppresses your immune system, he was just getting sick all the time. And as a result, missing school, missing class, and you know, if it, when it interrupts your life that much, whether you're working or going to school, um, you're getting sick, it's just going to interrupt your life in a big way, and it did his. Um, I was 17 when I was diagnosed, and I'm like 20 now, so 
three years ago, I started the prednisone and I've been on it consistently. I went from a thousand milligrams IV to right now I'm on three milligrams. And I would say the biggest thing that it's affected me with would be my mental health. Um, being a teenager in high school, um, a girl, it definitely, my self-esteem was affected greatly. Um, the weight gain was really hard going from a four-year varsity athlete to gaining 40 pounds in two months. It was really difficult. So I think that was the biggest effect for me. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add to what she said, and the we're all ladies up here, and it, it does sound silly, but looking at yourself in the mirror and not seeing the same person anymore is a really big deal, whether it be weight gain or I suffered from horrible weight loss. If you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're not seeing the person that you once did, it not only affects your self-esteem, but it affects your mentality on life and you know, are you going to get better? And it causes depression and, and all these things that happen from these drugs. It's, it's not silly. It's, it's actually really horrible. So I feel what you're going through. Uh, Amy, we've got a question back there. Um, what I like about steroids as well, like the other woman said, is that it is very effective. Um, it increases my energy, makes me feel way better, my breathing's great, my sinuses clear up. But what I don't like about it is, um, usually when I taper, if they raise my dosage or lower it, I have a lot of leg pain and fatigue. So it takes a while to acclimate to it and kind of get myself on a new schedule. And my concerns are the long-term side effects. I'm 26 and I already have the onset of cataracts. And I live a very active lifestyle like you guys do. Um, and I recently fractured my foot in two places just by missing a step. So it's just being more conscientious of what I'm doing. Um, and even though I'm young, kind of pretending I'm old in my head and being really careful so I don't hurt myself. Um, but overall, I think steroids are a great drug for us with our disease. Yes, hi. Hi, this, hi how are you? We've got my name uh, is Jimmy Pagg, somebody on the and phone. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend this this live conference, but I appreciate this so much. Um, I'm calling on behalf of my son. Um, you can go ahead. We weren't able to attend. Caller. He just had two surgeries within seven days. Um, my question is, um, due to all the pain that he's suffering and being a teenager, does anyone have any alternatives to um, help along with the pain? Um, I'm concerned because when we do go in. Um, they always bring up pain medication, but with the epidemic going on, that's just a big concern of mine. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Hello? Yes. So they, uh, you're coming yes, in it now. is. For, for teenagers, it's, um, again, it's just a fear of mine being with the epidemic going on nowadays and so the um, question most of the is about pain that, management is that correct your question is about pain advice. management he just turned 17 the teenagers in in the age of Does anybody have any uh, suggestions on pain management for uh, adolescent boy? Uh, so I have been on a uh, PCA pump. I've gone from Dilaudid to morphine, um, trying to control my pain. I see a pain management doctor once a month, and um, unfortunately, the narcotics have not helped me, and it has been months of narcotics going up. And finally, I said to my doctor that, you know, the narcotics just aren't working. My pain is constantly at a 7 or 8. At worst, it's a 9 or a 10, and I'm in the hospital. And I will say that if you can avoid narcotics, do so. Uh, last month, I saw my pain management doctor. I looked at him and said, I'd like to get off of the PCA. And he looked at me and said, until you are cured, you will always need narcotics. And I 
that right there was the turning point for me. I have been weaning myself off the PCA and looking for other alternatives because no one is going to tell me that I will be on narcotics for the rest of my life. And the side effects that you have from the narcotics, unless they're working and doing wonders for you, and they um, no, outweigh you know, the benefits the for it for actually, me. So uh, if you can avoid narcotics, had... I would do so. Have you found anything that does help your pain or lessens it, makes it more tolerable? Um, uh, I think it would just be overall pain. Um, my spine is a mess. Um, I've already had um, fusions, uh, three vertebrae fused in my neck. Um, my discs, um, off, prednisone just does this to your body. It really, um, the bone structure, everything. Um, pains in my knees, I've had knee surgeries. Um, uh, I would suggest um, if it's pain uh, associated with like, specific joints, um, there are uh, the steroid injections yeah. to get, um, and sometimes those can last three months, sometimes six months, sometimes only once, sometimes two or three, but depending on where the pain is located, if it's all over my head, I have occipital neuralgia, so I have to get injections in my head um, to try to ease up on the pain, but um, they do help, um, at least with my experience, they've helped. I just wanted to real quick, um, a pain management doctor that I saw at Hopkins offered to do a spinal cord stimulator for me in um, exchange for the narcotics. Unfortunately, most of my pain is in my GI tract, in my, my stomach, so uh, we kind of determined that that wasn't going to help for me. But if your pain is in your legs and in your spine, a spinal cord stimulator could be a, a huge difference maker um, for pain in the joints and stuff. Um, I, I was just going to, um, for the caller um, and uh, her son, um, I, uh, I know that I have to use pain medication and in the beginning um, I would go home in tears because I was, was treated like an addict and I just think educating him and helping them find a balance that it is okay if you need one or two, um, if you need it. But the biggest thing is just educating that, you know, how many people have died and you don't give it to other people. But, um, you know, he's not a bad person if he's in pain and needs it. Um, and the last thing you want them doing is hiding it or seeking it. Um, behind your back, and then there's real problems. So that was for the call there. So. And then I just wanted to add something that might be a little more unconventional, and not everybody um, will agree. Uh, but being from California, I have access to CBDs. I use them um, as uh, I, I've used the oil as drops under my tongue. I've used them in a capsule. Um, I've also used a topical cream when I'm having um, aches and pains. Um, I prefer the straight CBDs, and given that the caller's son is 17, I understand you know she doesn't want to get him on marijuana maybe, um, but there are other options where um, he won't have to have <laughs> the effects of the THC. Um, I also use essential oils. Um, there are a couple out there that you can use topically and internally. So I've just revealed to everybody that I'm a little bit of a hippie, <laughs> but it works for me. So that's another natural option. It is California. That's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add to that. And another thing to try that's worked for me is um, modifying your diet and sometimes your environment and sometimes your stress levels, because with my HES, my stress makes it worse. Certain foods make it worse. Um, weather changes make it worse. And sometimes taking note of that, taking the time to discover those things really does help. And honestly, also staying active, even if they are little walks or stretching, do help a lot with pain. Because for me, the more I'm inactive, 
the more my disease progresses when I have exacerbations. Again, very similar uh, teenage son, very similar to what she said, sort of a combination of exercise, attitude, and diet. And all three of those things sort of work hand in hand. So for him, um, he was an athlete, so he would work out, weight lift. And if you weight lift, you're going to be in pain. And that's much more tolerable, much more accepting. So he couldn't tell if it was pain based on HES or pain based. So he'd feel good about his pain, right? So that just helped the attitude, helped the stress, and they all kind of just worked together. And that was just sort of his level of pain management versus, you know, drugs and things like that. So that Hi, worked yep. for him. Um, but again, maybe his pain level was a little less, but it did sort of come together. Um, I have a son. I understand we have another he caller. He was 15. He is now 19. Um, he has been on steroids the entire time. As Go ahead. Yes. Um, he's, so he's been on steroids for four years, and we've tried twice to get him off. Um, both times he was almost in adrenal failure, so they had to okay, 19 year give old. him a large dose to get his adrenal system under control. Um, we're trying a third time to get him off. Um, He's had, you know, I can echo everything I've heard already, you know, the pain, the muscles, the weight gain, um, the acne, uh, moon face, the glucose that goes up and down. Um, but I think I could probably, from from a mother's standpoint, Sports. I think the steroids have had the most impact on just my family, the, the other two kids that are dealing with the, the rage and the, the temper effects. that just comes out of nowhere. Um, just him being irrational. You know, all three are teenagers, so they're all dealing with adolescent issues. Um, so, you know, he's going, dealing with the prednisone, and the prednisone is just making him angry and irrational and in the process my other two teenagers well, if you don't mind how is you know, hit from mind? out of nowhere with his temper um he would just go off on the least little thing and you know they weren't expecting it um look you know the family that i had four years ago is gone um i have three very different kids now and it's a lot of it has been due to prednisone um simply because the other two kids and my husband and I are impacted by, you know, just him trying to deal with everything that's changed in his world. I, I just can't even begin to say how much it impacts every single person in the house. And that family I once had, is it's gone. And the grieving period of, you know, knowing that I'm probably not going to get that family back and we just have to move on from here has probably been the hardest. So if I could you know, summarize what, what you said, because we're having a little bit of um, technical issues with the call. but. 19-year-old uh, been on steroids, and this has yeah. significantly impacted the entire family, including the siblings, related to side effects from those steroids and some of the medical issues and psychological issues that have resulted, I, I think is what I heard on the phone. Uh, does anyone have any comments on, on how to deal with those relationship issues in the family when you have uh, one person who is sick and perhaps having some... Uh, psychological challenges due to their therapy. Um, things that have helped me is finding outlets for my anger, and it does get better over time because you become familiar with those are my steroids talking or that really is me talking. Um, I started yoga, and I mean, I was into weightlifting. I thought yoga was goofy. But learning to calm yourself down, even if it's hectic around you, helps. Um, journaling and knowing sometimes you just need to go talk to a stranger, a counselor, a psychiatrist, because there is nothing wrong with that. And I think it's better to vent and be angry at a stranger than your boyfriend or mom. 
So sometimes it's kind of putting your ego aside and going and finding as much help as you can because it's there and it's at our disposal. So a number of suggestions from yoga, med meditation type activities to um, finding a, a third party to listen, whether that be therapist, counselor, or friend. Um, my son, my youngest son, has Tourette syndrome, and he has dealt with uh, rage outbursts. And it took us a while. We thought we were doing something wrong as parents, um, and we found out that that is actually uh, something that happens with Tourette syndrome. The, um, the way our family handled the rage outbursts was to talk him through it. Um, if we were not able to talk as a family, to discuss this is what's going on. This is not his fault. He's getting angry. Um, but we also don't allow it. We try to explain, OK, why are you angry? Let's deal with this. Let's work through it together as a family and um, have all parties of the family involved in it and understanding the situation and how to, um, how to help him through this um, hard time that he's going through. Um, and just work together as family, I guess. I know that um, one of my uh, biggest things with the steroids was once I actually learned how to like slow down before I responded, the steroids make you so like just on edge, like going so fast that you'll say things that you, you'll say things faster than you can even think and you're emotional um so just learn that you know learning how to just slow down um before you respond um i'll add to that so i'm not on steroids but the emotional effects that the disease itself has taken on me are uh, very difficult um sadness depression anger frustration you know, who do I take all these emotions out on? I am extremely lucky and blessed to have both my, my parents as an active role in my life and my boyfriend, who I've been with for nearly six years. But you have to recognize, like she said, where the line is, is you don't want to take it out on your family members and those you have relationships with because those are the only people you have to depend on. So for me, seeing a therapist was key. And it took me four different people until I finally found the one who clicked with me. But I will say that that has changed my outlook so much. Instead of being by myself inside, sad and angry all the time, I found different ways to vent, whether that be writing an email and sending it to God knows who or you know whatever it is, getting my emotions out and not taking them out on the people that help take care of me um, was really important for me. That is great advice, great advice. Um, any uh, other comments for our caller on how to handle some of these difficult family situations? No. All right. And any other callers, Mary Jo? If not, I was going to go back to one of the uh, discussion pieces we had missed in the last segment. So, uh, and, and this relates to what the caller had called in about. Um, do you feel that your hyperacinophilic syndrome has impacted your relationships with other people? And if so, how? Uh, and if you uh, are a family member here that is a caregiver for somebody with hyperacinophilic syndrome, how would you describe the impact on you as a caregiver? And uh, I'll start with our panel, but I do want to hear from some of the caregivers here as well. Uh, yeah, like I just said, um, it's been a really rough ride um, for my family. Um, I, like I said, I'm lucky to have the support of both my parents and my boyfriends, but it's been difficult for me to have to watch my parents miss time at work, uh, the relationships that it's affected with my sister because, you know, I'm getting most of the attention because I'm the sick one and, you know, bouncing in and out of the hospital. In the beginning, my friends were there to visit every day. 
I received calls and text messages, and, and that was when I was first sick. And as time went on, I kind of lost touch with you know, my friends and the people that I was close with. And now it's to the point where it almost feels like you're forgotten. And maybe that's because I'm not involved in all the social activities that I was before. And sure, people's lives continue to go on, but it almost feels like my life has stopped and everybody else has just continued to grow and to move on and get married and, and do all these things that at age 27, I feel like I should be doing too. So I think the relationships with my friends and my family, they've, they've definitely been affected. Um, but most importantly, if, if I don't take the time to reach out to them, why should I expect them to take the time to reach out to me? It's a double-edged sword, you know? So I think it's important to just remain you know, constant contact with the people that you care most about. Um, I think very similar as she does. Um, I, with my friends, they would plan something and I never knew how I was going to feel that day. And I accept an invitation to lunch and then the day comes and I can't get out of bed for like two hours and I have to cancel. And then I cancel something else. And um, I got to the point where I just, don't have a social life. Um, I have my kids, I have my husband, my family, and I have my animals, which is a lot of animals. And um, a lot. <laughs> Four dogs, two cats, two chinchillas, two guinea pigs, a talking parrot. Uh huh, yeah. <laughs> They're awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have uh, much of a social life because I couldn't commit to a lot of the plans outside of work. Um, if I had four hours of energy during the day, I spent it at work. Um, I didn't have energy left after work. And if I went before work, I'd be too tired to work. Um, my husband, at the beginning, was very difficult because um, I couldn't help around the house as much as I normally did. Um, I couldn't help the kids as much. And he helped me with that a lot, and it got better as he understood my illness. Um, it, at first, you know, sometimes people think you're just being lazy or you just don't want to do something. And that is so not the case. There's so many things that I wish I could do with energy, but um, sometimes you just don't have the energy to do it. Um, and since AGS isn't like written on our head that that's what we are, we have. Um, it's kind of difficult for others to understand how severe it is unless they have it as well. Um, so for even caregivers, my husband, he, he's had to learn to, um, that we had to work together on how to get things done. Um, I, I think it's definitely um, affected every single relationship. Um, I've uh, been through counseling just to help me stay in the present moment. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'm so affected by the past um, or the future. Uh, I jump to the worst case scenario a lot. Um, when I first had my daughter, I probably took her to the emergency room like 20 times in two months. Um, just so paranoid that something was going to happen to her. Um, and I also, um, you know, a lot of guilt if, you know, the, the constant like if tomorrow never comes thought. Uh, so it's really hard to like leave something unsaid or at a negative. Um, I mean, I think it affects every relationship you have and you can take it good or bad. Um, in a lot of ways, um, you know, I'm a stronger person, probably a better mom, a better friend, um, not taking so much uh, time for granted, things like that. Uh, I can definitely relate to the things that these ladies have said um, and have had some similar experiences with, with my relationships. Um, just to touch on something a little bit different that I experienced um, after I came home from the hospital and even prior to that, um, I was having a lot of um, 
menstruating problems. I was having a lot of um, issues with, you know, just being regular, and I had been going on for a while before I was diagnosed and then after. And so one of the concerns they had was if I had um, any sort of uterine cancer. We knew that eosinophils had affected my ovaries. Um, and so to um, kind of investigate that a little bit further, I had to undergo a biopsy of my uterus. Um, I had to have multiple <laughs> exams, gynecological. I had to see a specialist um, just to make sure um, you know, there wasn't something else going on down there. And um, a lot of you women can probably relate that it's that, that maybe not to that extreme, but it's very invasive. And between that and how the prednisone was affecting my body um, and the depression and the weight gain, I just at some point I just felt like I just didn't even know my own body anymore. And the result of all that, it, the, big, the biggest relationship that affected um, was between my husband and I, because now I've gained weight, I'm depressed, I feel like every doctor within a 30 mile radius of my home has been inside my vagina. So <laughs> I didn't really want to invite anybody else in, if you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> so that had a big effect, um, in addition to just my kids trying to understand what I was going through and my family and um, that was one of the re one of the biggest reasons I wanted to come here today was just to meet anybody else that had any idea what I was going through. So, just real quick, I wanted to add to what Lauren said. the The fear of like when's the other shoe gonna drop is huge. Um, I go to bed at night saying prayers that I'll wake up the next day, um, and the anxiety that I have, I was never an anxious person before, but my anxiety has taken over so much that there are days I can't even get in the car and go for a ride without worrying if I'm gonna, if we're gonna get in an accident or, so the fear of worrying all the time goes beyond my disease. It has affected every aspect of my life. Like I said, just waiting for the other shoe to drop and always thinking that something bad is going to happen. And certainly going to the doctor's office is not a pleasant experience because I can't tell you the last time I was given good news. So that that's another issue too, is, is the depression and the anxiety and the worry of, am I ever gonna get better or is today my last day? So it's a lot to handle. Anybody in the audience want to comment on caregiver or patient perspective? Well, I don't think I'm a caregiver as much as I am a proud spouse today. Um, so Lorraine's got a special case where she's been sick most of her life. So you're talking about 27 years of dealing with this. So when someone tells you they're sick and they're op honest and open with that, you don't realize what's really going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, so it's been kind of crazy at times, um, but she's been awesome. But I think the biggest part is, especially for that caller, the second caller is being direct. Um, direct and what's going on. What did you take today? How are things going? Did you get bad news? Where are you at? Because in our relationship, not being direct, built resentment, built distance between us. And that was the hardest part, getting over that. Going through our ups and downs, then now kind of being up in our relationship is pretty awesome. And it took 10 years, so I mean, that's all our part. So. Thank you for sharing that. All right. If there are no other comments or questions, I was going to introduce our next speaker. And uh, no more callers, is that right? OK. All right, Dr. Panice Curry is our next speaker. She joins us from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the NIH. She is a researcher and an expert on eosinophilic diseases. She's been involved for a number of years in clinical and translational research in the human eosinophil section at the NIH. She is a member of multiple societies and uh, 
has, is well published on this particular disease. So I'm going to ask her to come talk to us about the current treatment options for hypereosinophilic syndrome, common side effects, and at the end of her talk we will have some time for um, questions and answers regarding uh, treatment options. And after that, we will be taking a little break for lunch. Thank you.